Okay. Um, hello and welcome to the August webinar of the Seabed Habitat Seminar Series. Um, this webinar is by Shreya Namani and um, Julia McKin McLaughlin. Um, yeah. Um, and um, they're from the 4D Oceans Lab in um, of Memorial um, University um, in Newfound Newfoundland. Um, and um, the webinar is entitled Baseline Characterization of Species Assemblages in Ecologically and Biologically Sensitive Areas, um, EBSAs, um, in Placentia Bay, Newfoundland, and Labrador, Can Canada. So um, both Shreya and um, Julia are MSc students at the 4D Oceans Lab of Memorial University. Yeah. So, um, and we're very pleased to welcome them to give this seminar. <laughs> so um, yeah, without further ado, I'll hand it over to, um, to you two. Me two. Cool. Yeah, thank you. So you. You guys all see the screen, right? It's all, we're still oh, we presenting. Haven't, I haven't shared it. Oh, okay, so we'll, we'll for sure. <clears throat> there we go. And just open up notes. Okay, cool. Cool. All right. Um, so, hello, everyone. Thank you for attending our seminar today. Um, so, my name is Shreya, and I'm presenting. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Oh, no worries. <laughs> and I'm, Presenting along with my colleague here, Julia. Um, as Siddhi said, we're both master students from the 40 Oceans Lab. Um, so our lab aims to advance our understanding of seafloor heterogeneity and assess the spatial and temporal variation of species distributions. <clears throat> the work we'll present today falls under Canada's Coastal Environmental Baseline Program, intending to achieve a baseline characterization for the ecology of Placentia Bay which will be the focus for this seminar today. So this Canada's Coastal Environmental Baseline Program was initiated for areas at risk of increasing high vessel traffic and subsequent human impacts across various parts of Canada's incredibly long coastline. Establishing this baseline data is challenging since most of the time the existing state of the seabed is not even known and is often difficult to monitor. So specifically, the focus of this talk, uh, Placentia Bay in Newfoundland and Labrador, and it's classed as an ecologically and biologically significant area, as it supports a diverse nearshore environment, which includes eelgrass habitat, sensitive corals and sponges, and various other habitats for ecologically important or threatened species, such as the leatherback turtle, Atlantic salmon, and capelin. And ecological uh, reserve is also situated at the southeastern tip of the bay and is famous for its vast colonies of seabirds. And it's also part of the Grand Banks Large Ocean Management Area, which is renowned internationally to support rich fishing grounds, which include cod, swordfish, haddock, capelin, et cetera. So here, depicted here is a map of critical habitats that were identified using local ecological knowledge for parts of the bay. So this includes important areas for marine mammals such as seal and whale uh, and many other that we'll mention. But at the same time, it is also a hotbed for various human activities ranging from recreational use to heavy industry and fisheries and aquaculture. Specifically, various fin fish aquaculture sites have been proposed around the bay, which are forecasted to be one of Canada's largest aquaculture initiatives. So you can see that there's considerable risk of growing human impact in the bay, but in order to protect and better manage these have seabed habitats, we need to first understand their presence, their extent and distribution so that we can figure out which areas to prioritize. So our specific project, uh, Coastal Habitat Mapping of Placentia Bay, seeks to improve our ability to detect changes occurring over time by developing an understanding of the current state and composition of the seabed. The aim is to develop habitat maps representing distinct regions of the seabed based on their biological and their physical properties. 
Development of these maps relies on, a vari on various data sources, including the collection of high resolution, continuous acoustic data using, for our case, multi-beam and side scan sonars. So while much of the Bay had been previously surveyed by various federal initiatives, for example, the Canada's Geological Survey and Canadian Hydrographic Service, many shallow coastal sites were excluded as they are more difficult and time consuming to survey than deeper parts of the Bay. So this is due to the physical limitations of using the large research vessels that are for deeper areas, using them in shoal regions have uh, technical limitations related to the sonar instrument and its diminished swath width. In shallow regions, it just becomes inefficient. You'd have to go back and forth a lot more than you do in deeper regions. So this area of missing data because of this uh, issue in the relatively shallow region of the coast is often called the white ribbon. Sites were targeted for additional acoustic surveys within this data deficient area. The sites surveyed by our, by our lab are outlined in this figure in black. These sites were all selected for their ecological importance overlapped with anthropogenic influence that it's common for coastal communities. So for example, the first one, Dargent Bay is identified as an important site for capelin spawning, herring aggregations, and it's one of the largest areas for whale sightings in Placentia Bay. Another site that we surveyed was Rashoon, which is relatively remote from coastal communities as compared with the other three sites, but it is set to have salmon aquaculture cages, which may alter this relatively pristine local ecology. The acoustic sonar data that you can derive information on topography of the seabed using a wide swath of sound beams across the track of the boat. Um, backscatter data is simultaneously collected and is a proxy for sediment type indicated by the sound intensity reflected off the seabed. So for example, hard substrates will have a high backscatter return um, that might include bedrock or gravel or boulders compared to soft sediments such as mud or sand where much of the sound wave gets absorbed so it's a lower backscatter return. Multi-beam surveys were conducted over the summer of 2019 and 2020 for the four sites along the west coast of the bay. Uh, the process exemplified in this figure to the right, so the boats going across the survey area, then we process the multi-beam data collected to build, uh, for example, 3D digital elevation models of the seafloor with some pretty extensive detail of the seafloor topography. It's amazing what technology can do now. Um, and the processed multi-beam data is shown here for each site, depicting the bathymetry across the survey areas at a fairly high resolution of five by five meters. So we have a lot of good details in these survey areas. These bathymetric layers, along with backscatter layers derived from the collected signal strength, which you can see on the left, um, were used to derive secondary features to describe additional seabed geomorphology and texture. These derivatives represent physical surrogates, which are measurable characteristics of the environment used to infer information for a more direct feature, one that could be challenging to map at sufficient spatial resolution. So for example, starting with bathymetry, we could derive slope and aspect to represent the steepness gradient in regards to slope or the orientation of a slope. So if it's more north facing or more west facing, um, they can be used to infer information related to local current flow and water movements, which is generally only available at coarser scales. Further, the exposure of a surface to water movements can dictate food supply, which would influence species composition. So higher slopes adjacent to a current flow would be more favorable to filter feeders such as anemones. And we've included just a video of um, one of our sites in Rashoon, where you can see how slope changes. And so from backscatter, derived attributes visualize the texture of the seafloor. So this includes the contrast of the seafloor as an example, visualizing stark differences in hardness or softness of the substrate across an area. If an area is highly heterogeneous versus homogeneous, like a lot of boulders mixed in with a lot of fine sediment, uh, this may have implications for species presence. As well, greater heterogeneity heterogeneity may be linked with greater species richness. So in this video, you can see there is bedrock, but you can also see little areas punctuated like right there of fine sediment. 
In short, these derived physical characteristics are not direct drivers of species environment relationships, but they do offer measurable proxies that help explain the ecology of a local area. Also, here we see an example to the right of the uh, increasing window sizes used to derive features across multiple scales using one of the survey areas as an example. Why this is important to use a multi-scale approach, uh, integrating information from multiple analysis scales is because it captures both fine scale and broad scale variability of the seabed terrain. To illustrate this concept, what is seen here as a gently sloping section of the seabed encompasses a much deeper valley at a broader scale. This is also evident in the vertical profiles for the bathymetry as an example. So you can imagine how the scale at which terrain features are calculated can influence our interpretation of seabed morphology. Since we cannot tell the biological composition and substrate characteristics of the seabed using the multi-beam data, underwater video surveys were also conducted to assess species community at seabed composition. You see here the underwater camera that we use. It was set up on the research vessel with the survey team going out, that's us, dropping the camera so it is roughly one to two meters above the seafloor. These video samples were collected for the four sites previously mentioned, which included the two additional sites which already had existing sonar data from the earlier government surveys of the bay. These sites accommodate busy shipping ports and commercial harbors and have been influenced by heavy human activity throughout the decades. These surveys were arguably some of our favorite parts of this project as we were treated with some incredible views as we descended to uh, sometimes a couple hundred meters to the seabed. Uh, get to see some cool little crabs and anemones. We saw a skate ray. Uh, we even found a previously unknown shipwreck which if you're interested, our blog has an article about it. And we have so many more things that we've seen as well as even collecting some souvenirs to bring back to the surface. Mm -hmm. Some seaweed salad, you know, you're working really hard, you need a snack. Um, but video analysis mainly involved counting and identifying the unique species that we saw from all of these videos, which um, were later classified into species assemblages using clustering methods. And in addition, moving back to the more physical attributes of the seabed away from the biota to, uh, in addition to deriving secondary features at scales that increase in size from the original resolution, we've noted that attention should be given to fine scale details as well. For example, seen here is a snippet of an image of the video footage used to identify substrate classes located in a survey site. So for a entire two minute video of a single site, we gave it one uh, substrate class denoting it as boulder. But if you actually go through and you grid and identify more specific um, substrate denotions, you'll notice that it's fairly heterogeneous and it does well to separate as many classes as possible within each video. So what was boulder is now a mixture of boulder, gravel mix and fine sediment. And to kind of drive this point home, a video of our, one of our sites in Rashoon shows an example of how quickly substrates can change, including in this specific case, a hard boundary between faunal assemblages. Um, this isn't always the case, but for this specific site, there was an interesting phenomenon where initially the site was given a single substrate class of bedrock, which you can already see is a bit of a problem because it switches to fine sediment. And this is roughly halfway between the video so later on, I actually went back and divided the site into two separate sites with um, my percent coverage method of varying substrates instead of a single class. This also meant that the high count of urchins as well as the high count of sand dollars that were, were associated with bedrock or fine sediment respectively were separated into two different sites. And what this did was change our funnel assemblages. So instead of one single assemblage with urchins and sand dollars as a two dominant species. There were two, uh, two assemblages, one that had sand dollars and one that had urchins and in addition sea stars as a dominant species. So it actually changed what assemblages you would expect to see. Um, so for the final habitat maps, these classified species assemblages uh, derived from the clustering method previously mentioned were modeled using machine learning methods um, to predict the spatial distribution of the species assemblages for each site uh, in Placentia Bay. 
So the modeling method can have can vary and the performance often is varied as well. Uh, but part of our research also involved the comparison of various commonly used classification models, um, out of which we chose the model with the highest accuracy for our final maps. Uh, so the next few slides provide a general overview of the underlying biological classification and their predicted distribution across space. So for purposes of this seminar, we chose to focus on three specific assemblages that were shared across most of the sites occurring in the bay. Although for this specific site that's depicted here, it's Mortier Bay on the west coast, uh, five assemblages were mapped. So depicted here in purple is the distribution of the assemblage occurring along soft sediment, muddy substrate with some underlying rock and found between valleys and more sloped areas. And when I say deepest, I'm referring to areas between 80 to 200 meters, which is just below the boundary for coastal areas, I guess. Um, and biologically, it is composed of the Hermathia anemone, uh, brittle stars, and some occurrence of the northern shrimp and snow crab. Uh, next, this assemblage noted in light blue is mainly composed of the northern sea star and high densities of sea urchin, which Julia just kind of, kind of mentioned earlier, and found among the rock, rocky hard substrate. Uh, it's composed of large boulder, cobble, and some mix of uh, gravel as well. So from the map, it can be seen among areas of higher relief, unlike the previous assemblage, which was found in more deeper valleys. So its distribution is also more limited uh, just because of the morphology of this site, which had a mix of soft and hard sediments. <clears throat> And finally, this last assemblage is exclusively composed of sandy fine gravel substrate with sand dollars and mussels, including their shell hash. Uh, its di distribution appears very limited, mainly occurring along flat areas of the coast. However, there's also some uncertainty in this prediction as it was the shallowest assemblage occurring adjacent to the rocky coastline in more shoal areas where sampling even with our smaller research vessel was quite limited. And here is the final habitat map, which also includes two additional assemblages um, that we didn't describe in more detail, but it, they briefly consist of more common sea stars in the pink and a community of sponges uh, or peripheral species indicated in the gray. So dissemination of this information using full coverage habitat maps, such as this one, is important to planning and management since it supports efforts to guide decisions decisions concerning the marine environment using more informed evidence-based decision-making. For example, the extent, distribution, and composition of a particular assemblage can indicate which areas are more sensitive and need to be prioritized for management. So looking at this map, we see both blue color assemblages are limited in their distribution uh, compared to others with larger spatial extents. So these factors, along with species composition, proximity to human activity and seascape morphology can be considered when planning how we use these areas. And in, in addition to studying the biological composition of assemblages, we were also interested in studying aspects of their diversity and functional characteristics. So assessing the diversity of habitats based on their biological composition, as we just discussed, can help us to target areas that may be more ecologically valuable or have any focal species to protect. And this is important since uh, benthic species exhibit very distinct characteristics that are important in supporting various ecological functions. As you can see in the image, they, they can contribute to nutrient cycling, um, re benthic remineralization. Re they provide uh, complex habitat for other species to reside in. So they, they do provide a lot of uh, services. And further, the example of bioturbation or sediment reworking exhibited by many mollusks, such as mussels, are known to contribute to important services such as nutrient cycling. Um, so accordingly, an increasing number of studies are also incorporating functional components by assessing the biological traits of uh, benthic species based on their life history, their morphology, and behavioral characteristics in order to shed light on this aspect of ecological functioning. So this type of approach is not species, 
species specific and can be considered for areas that don't necessarily share the same species because you're looking at the behavior or the uh, characteristics that they exhibit. <clears throat> so to illustrate the importance of considering functional traits, here in community A, there are six different species contributing to higher species richness and diversity where abundances are more evenly spread compared to the community B on the right with lower species and abundances. However, when we consider both communities based on their functional characteristics, community A exhibits lower functional richness, which is the number of unique traits in a region. And the diversity of traits present is also lower since many of the key functions are shared among species, making them more redundant. For example, the clams, the mussels, sand dollars, shrimp, and brittle star all have been studied as important bioturbators or sediment reworking through their body movements, feeding method, or defecation. Uh, meanwhile, the committee on the right exhibits lower redundancy where although some functions are shared among taxa, for example, both the sponge and anemone species filter feed and have limited movement, their body form, sociability, and reproduction method, for example, all vary. So this can shed light on their resilience or vulnerability to any disturbance and help us assess which activities would be most critical for each assemblage and to what degree. And this will be discussed in the next few slides. So here we assess the functional composition of the assemblages. And here this ordination diagram is overwhelming to look at at first glance. But what it depicts is how functionally similar or dissimilar the assemblages are. So specifically, the assemblages that were discussed today are numbered as two, four, and five in purple and blue, and I'll go into more detail. Uh, so here on closer look, this section of the ordination diagram highlights which specific traits contributed most to the dissimilarity among the five assemblages. So here is the deepest assemblage, assemblage, which was characterized by anemones on the soft sediment, and it is functionally distinguished uh, by traits that were more sessile so with limited movement, uh, attached and more upright organisms, which could make them more susceptible to vertical disturbances, uh, specifically such as any fishing activity. Um, their lack of mobility of most of the species also means that they're less capable of avoiding these impacts or moving away from them. Here, the urchin and hard subshoot assemblage is denoted as number four and the sandy or sand with sand dollar assemblage um, is denoted as number five. And they're both functionally similar despite hosting very different species communities. So both assemblages depict so surface dep deposit feeding with more gregarious species, meaning the organism forms groups or clusters as seen with both the sand dollars and the urchins. However, with the sandy substrate evident in assemblage five, it hosted organisms with more oval body forms and worming creatures due to the substrate that they're associated with and could make them more resilient against vertical disturbance, uh, unlike the previous assemblage. Um, however, with trawling and dragging activities that can rework or modify soft sediment environments, these could be detrimental to the assemblage, um, assemblage five, I mean, with the sand dollar, because it contains bioturbating organisms that thrive in mixed sand and mud environments. Further, the trait and species information were consolidated into single metrics describing richness and diversity using both species identities and functional traits. So these metrics were modeled and mapped to assess their spatial patterns to identify any uh, areas of concern or hotspots for diversity. So here, the number of species and functional richness each describe the number of unique species and traits for the site. For example, areas depicted as having large numbers of species or high species richness also host a large number of unique biological traits, which makes sense ecologically since different species in a region can exhibit a unique configuration of biological traits. Conversely, regions that were considered biologically diverse were not necessarily functionally diverse. So especially this uh, helps us to identify any alternate hotspots by also studying this aspect of functional diversity. So overall, the results from considering these aspects of functional traits for all the benthic species in, in our analysis 
uh, presented here aim to highlight that just using species specific assessments of diversity, composition, and distribution may provide limited information and can be further complemented using an organism's traits or characteristics. So we have focused a lot on seabed fauna, um, but another aspect of our work in Placentia Bay includes assessment of the flora ecology and distribution. It is not enough to just look at the benthic faunal assemblages located along the coast of Placentia Bay. Benthic marine flora are crucial to a healthy coastal ecosystem, and many are familiar with the large charismatic underwater forests of kelp. For example, the giant kelps off of California's coast are iconic to any marine macrophyte biologist or really any marine biologist. Uh, essentially, the thing is with thin cold water coastal habitats from temperate regions to the Arctic and wherever rocky substrates exist, kelp will likely persist. And with them, their invaluable benefits. The ecological importance of kelp forests cannot be understated. They represent some of the most productive and diverse habitats on Earth, providing ecosystem services worth billions annually. They are primary and secondary producers, nurseries, they provide refuge and shelter from predators, uh, they are carbon sequesters, and their physical structure is relied on by other fauna, um, one attribute that contributes to their critical role as a bolster a booster of local biodiversity. Uh, determined, this last trait is determined to be one of the most important ecosystem services provided by kelp forests. Um, even though they are shorter lived and shorter in height compared to their terrestrial woody forest counterparts, they are more productive and provide for a greater diversity at the phyla level. So phyla such as chordates, arthropods, annelids, echinoderms, mollusks, periphera, or bryozoans, and periphera. So as mentioned, kelp forests serve as a habitat forming structure, there, but their influence over the abundance and distribution of species can either be a direct or indirect influence of their presence, such as they may provide a 3D surface for a biota to settle on, or they may be a source of food as detritus. So within the Northwest Atlantic, where the study takes place, the predominant order is the brown kelp laminarios, uh, which includes, and get to practice my Latin here, Saccharina latissima, Laminaria digitata, Saccharina longicruris, and Agarum clathrotum, which the latter one becomes important when you consider what's happened to kelp forests across the Northwest Atlantic coast. So kelp forests face intense herbivorous pressure from the green sea urchin, uh, Strongylocentrotus drogafiensis. Green sea urchins have reduced kelp forests to a barren state, um, they're, the urchins are herbivores, so they're essentially just munching on this delicious sea salad. And, and the barren state is then made up of predominantly pink, hard coralline algae instead of fleshy green or fleshy brown kelp. These barrens exist along the Northwest Atlantic. Sometimes you see them just with an area of 10 to 100 meters punctuating the surviving kelp forests, but sometimes they extend to over thousands of kilometers of coastlines. So um, they occur from the Gulf of Maine to Nova Scotia up to Newfoundland. And the loss of this primary productivity and biodiversity associated with kelp forest means that this barren state represents a collapse state of this usually beneficial and critical ecosystem. So here's just an example of what you might see. This was from uh, some of our surveying where urchins were plenty and kelp was not to be seen. However, agarum clathrotum survives due to its integrated chemical defense, making it a distasteful choice to urchins. Um, sort of like if you ate grass. It's not really preferred, but if there's literally any other green vegetable available. So agarum is easily identified as it has a large dark green or brown blade perforated with numerous holes across the entire blade, giving it its colloquial name of sieve kelp or shotgun kelp. Agarum can form these dense but fairly short forests along the coast, penetrating to depths of 60 meters. These forests were found to in different degrees across Placentia Bay, sometimes very thick, like what you can see in this image, and sometimes very sparse, like one or two um, specimens. So, but they represent a stark difference from the pink urchin coated barrens often in the shallow. But these areas you can see have a pink encrusting coralline algae. 
So coralline algae are a genus of macrophytes that are best known for their hard structure, reinforced by calcium carbonate to maintain their rigidity. They exist as either free living or crustose, articulated or not. Um, their free living form includes coralline algae growing around a nodule with many of these balls, which you can see in the C figure to the right, coating the seafloor, forming extensive fields of individuals. And um, if they are not free living, they exist as crustose forms that coat rocks or shells or even human trash, including sometimes uh, bottles, which is a great souvenir for divers around here. So these forms are either smooth, looking like a pink paint, or coated in bulbous nodules. Coralline algae, like kelp forests, have the potential to bolster local biodiversity, including cold water environments. Their structural complexity in the form of nodules, branches, uh, bumps and lumps provide habitat for a diverse group of organisms. This image from one of our video surveys, you can kind of see these wispy little lines. Those are actually all ophiroid arms hidden in between the nodules of the coralline algae. And in the Northwest Atlantic, the porous matrix of rhodose beds includes associated species such as burrowing bivalves, uh, marine worms, amphipods, and additional mollusks. The crustose coralline algae, which is more common along Placentia Bay and where we survey, it does play a structural role, a carbon sequestering role, and hosts invertebrate di diversity such as chitons, limpets, ophiroids, and of course, urchins. So these repositories of fauna, as well as the garum clathrotum, may provide refuge for species which otherwise have lost their home as urchins decimate shallow water kelp forests. Or they may support a group of fauna different from other kelp forests. This is something worthwhile to investigate. These flora uh, exist in droves across certain parts of Placentia Bay. For example, one survey site was coated in a high percent coverage of Agarum clathrotum, which you can see the large dark green circles are representative of an almost 100% uh, percent coverage of Agarum. So in contrast, the other three sites where we have information for this have very few sites with evident Agarum forests. These forests show an association with a specific assemblage. So going into just quick detail on that, the faunal assemblage with urchins as a dominant species shows a higher average of agarum substrate class than any of the other substrate classes. This pie chart specifically, the agarum clathrotum class represents 31% coverage, um, the average across all sites that were denoted by this urchin assemblage. And this compares with the other sites where substrate classes where the average was calculated, which rarely went over 1%, um, sometimes reaching 10%, but very rarely was a garum, did a garum have such a presence as we see in this pie chart. So when looking at how the percent coverage of a garum clathrotum compares with urchins, there is little overlap between high urchin counts and high percent coverage of a garum forests. Agarum's deep penetration extends beyond the usual habitat of urchins, which may be another factor of why agarum thrives where urchins do not. And another issue may be a consequence of the thick nature of agarum forests, as that picture a few slides back showed. Um, using video footage, it can be difficult to see what fauna are below the agarum canopy, unless a wave pushes it aside and you get a snippet of the ground or the seafloor. Um, you're not really sure what's there at the bottom nor are you sure of what might be living on the blades or the stem or the holdfast. Um, for example, one of the assemblages, you could see an association of a stocked jellyfish that lived on the kelp blade, but you only get lucky if the camera just happens to catch it at a glance. So it would be interesting, I think, to collect algae samples or perform, perform dive surveys where possible to see if urchin populations do overlap or what specific benthic fauna live in the agarum forest considering they're one of the few forests that we see along the uh, coast of Placentia Bay. So this kind of surveying should also include sampling the coralline algae present within complex 3D structures um, to see what the biodiversity this macrophyte group also hosts. So it is obvious that there is a richly diverse and functional ecosystem existing along the coast of Placentia Bay. At least that's what we hope you gathered from this presentation. It is well deserving of its ecologically and biologically significant area title, and the baseline knowledge derived from this research is a strong first step towards understanding and conserving the local ecological functioning. 
We now have a look into the benthic fauna present, including their distribution and function, as well as the local flora that survives even with herbivorous pressure from the voracious green sea urchins. We hope you have enjoyed the information presented here by both Shreya and myself. This work, uh, as mentioned, is part of the 4D Ocean Lab at the Marine Institute um, and Memorial University of Newfoundland and Labrador, which has many research projects ongoing. And I just wanna take a moment to point them out. So in addition to the work we presented today on Placentia Bay, our colleague has also developed maps of eelgrass distribution using a drone along parts of the bay's northern and eastern coast. They are also assessing how the extent of eelgrass changed over time using aerial photos. Other projects outside of Placentia Bay, but still in Newfoundland, include, include a seasonal comparison of habitat maps in nearby Conception Bay, which this is a 3D uh, bathymetry map of Conception Bay. Um, Conception Bay has also launched a new underwater observatory to be used for real-time monitoring of the benthos and assess the impact of spring phytoplankton bloom on the surrounding uh, fauna. And farther north of the island of Newfoundland will soon commence research to study parts of the Labrador coast and develop maps of species distributions as well. Um, we currently just have no pictures of that, but Outside of the province, there's also work being done on the west coast of Canada in British Columbia using data collected from the Neptune Underwater Cable Observatory in Berkeley Canyon. Specifically, the temporal dynamics of the deep sea pink urchin were studied, which includes the period of the 2013 marine heat wave or the blob. So that's just a quick picture of what that looks like. Beyond the Canadian coast, members of our lab are characterizing the benthic species assemblages and developing 3D models of vertical walls in the Charlie Gibbs fracture zone, which you may have observed this ridge during any transatlantic flight. I'm looking at that little screen, there's not much else to do on the plane. Um, so that's just an example of some of the things that they have seen from their videos. And lastly, we are venturing into warmer waters to achieve similar levels of baseline characterization for parts of the Galapagos Islands. Uh, and hope to continue our efforts to cover more areas across the globe. This project received much support through various collaborations, and I wanna thank everyone involved with data collection, supervision, and all the funding that was received. Without these parties, this wouldn't be possible. And we would just like to say thank you and open up the floor for questions, uh, concerns, or comments, whatever you guys were here. Um, yeah, so thank you so much. Um, thank you very much, um, Shreya and Julia, um, for the very um, insightful and um, uh, um, exciting study about um, about um, the um, species assemblages. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, um, I can check if, like. Um, if, you, if anybody has a question, please feel free to put it in the chat or um, raise your hand and I can unmute you. Um, uh, I had a question about the, um, just about the assemblages, like, um, do you, um, did you specifically fo focus on the, um, um, ecologically, biological, biologically um, significant area, areas um, as for like for for the um, um, like the um, uniqueness or rarity of the assemblages, or is like um, did you? Um, uh, no, so we we based our assemblages based on, um, so we it was an unsupervised method, so we did our video surveys and uh, just based on the, just based on how the, like the abundance and the associations of species within those videos, the clustering method identified uh, distinct assemblages. So we didn't have a target species or we didn't classify them qualitatively that, that this, this assemblage has more unique species kind of thing. We wanted to make it more um, automated, semi-automated, the process. Okay, yeah. And, um, um, and like 
and also about um, the cryptic species. So like, which which cryptic species did you did you find? Uh, or, um, like, um, just just a bit, bit um, if 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 you if you feel um, your your method your methodology um, um, st studied the ecology of like of cryptic species or yeah cryptic species are more challenging using underwater videos uh, video cameras just because mm -hmm. um, we're not directly sampling the benthos so it's hard to usually the cryptic or the very mobile species are not captured as efficiently using video surveys and we recognize that as a limitation of the method so we are um, we do and usually if we do observe a cry very cryptic or rare species they if they're occurring in very low abundance or density they they're not included in the analysis because there isn't enough to um, typify any assemblage using that species because we're looking at dominant species or indicator species in our analysis i don't know if you have <laughs> no that's exactly yeah um if it had a count of i think less than three or five individuals across all sites the species was removed from analysis, which is a shame because we didn't get to keep the skate, but yeah. <laughs> we got to see it. So we only saw one skate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, um, in, in the chat, there's a question that um, how long were the drop camera transects to ground truth the area? And how did you determine where to perform these transects? That's from Kimberly Galvez of NOAA. Um, yeah, so the transects were at least two minutes long. Um, so it was based off of a time, not necessarily how many meters were covered. Um, and we just ensured that there were two minutes of good video, so not too fast, not too blurry, not too far away, um, so that we could actually get a accurate understanding of what species were there, like they were able to be identified. And how to determine where to perform these transects, we actually used a code in our first we collected bathymetry and backscatter. So we understood the depth and different substrate types um, as it was a proxy for uh, sediment hardness. And we made it so each ground truthing point represented the difference in depth and uh, backscatter. I don't know if you want to add more to that. Yeah, it's commonly known as a, a spatially balanced sampling design. So uh, we wanted to note that each of our samples are point samples, not transects. Uh, and that's because in the two minutes, uh, if we go, we found two minutes to be optimal to minimize drift from the boat, because if it's longer, then it's no longer that point sample and the location is off. Uh, so that combined with the uh, spatially balanced sampling design, like Julia said, was to uh, encompass very broad seabed environments. So we're not just sampling, you know, muddy, muddy bottom the whole time. We wanted to encompass a wide range of substrate and uh, seabed types. Um, and um, thank you. Thank you. There's a thank you from them um, for the great talk. Um, and I, I also had a question about um, you, uh, just the GLCMs. Um, okay. you, um, did you did you look at the um, contra like the is it the we like to go to the right. <laughs> I was going to go to that point. <laughs> but yeah. sorry, continue. Which, um, which, um, like, which metric did you find was most useful? Like, did you, did you, um, look at the, um, uh, like the entropy of the homogeneity? Or? Uh, yeah, so um, 
in the end, the layers that I used were homogeneity and contrast to capture the similarities and uh, differences in CBAT. Entropy was excluded during feature selection methods. So before, uh, before I included my final set of variables, we computed a feature selection method to just try to narrow or reduce the dimensionality of the data set because it was very large otherwise. Uh, so in the end, yeah, it was just entropy. No, it was just homogeneity and contrast that were included. But I I have read that entropy is a very important determining environmental variable. Uh, just for this, it's just for our specific sites, it wasn't the most influential. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, um, I I do think entropy for like like uh, flora or uh, meryl or like eelgrass or those type of habitats, that would probably be quite important. Mm -hmm. uh, it yeah, I can actually jump on that because I did um, modeling using entropy for flora and, and it wasn't as important as one might expect, but the broad scale entropy that we used did help to explain where agarum would be located. It okay. seemed Mm. Um, and, okay, um, yeah, yeah, it's, um, it's very, like, that, that's really interesting because, um, the floor, like, the flora, um, is, is responding in a different, like, in a, in a different way than the fauna, which is quite, like, um it, it's it's interesting to see um to see that you found that yeah um so um if anybody has any questions or um if you want I'll, I'll, yeah if if um Okay, well, um, feel free to email us too. Like, if mm -hmm. you can't think of anything now, oh, yeah. <laughs> if you're ruminating, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I guess they're there. Yeah, okay. Um, no. Feel free um, to check out our website as well. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so, um, so I think, um, I think that's that's a real real, real um, uh, that's a, like a real snapshot view of the um, of the habitat mapping um, approaches, like from assemblage from different assemblages and um, and um, and then like with with multi beam and. Um, Also, the like video transacts. I mean, video point, point sample, and um, so um, okay. So if 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 um, if if you ha um, like if you if you have any um, query queries, then please do check out the website for theoceans.com. And um, and I'd just like to thank um, Julie, um, Shreya and Julia for um, um, taking the time to make this presentation and um, and sharing your research. Um, so um, yeah. thank you for giving us a platform. This was this was a good experience for us. No, and thank you. Looking yeah. forward to the next few seminars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and I think it's 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 really great that um that um we have like so 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 much um um so much involvement from um from uh from uh, stu students as well as um, like pr professors or um, 
PhD, PhD students or master students. And, and I think it's a really great way to, um, uh, to learn more about, um, about the research happening around the world. And um, <laughs> so I, I hope it's been um, interesting for you as well. <laughs> Mm -hmm, for sure. This is great. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks. Well, um, uh, on that note, I think we can um, conclude the seminar. So... Thank you, everyone, for attending. <laughs> Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. See ya. See you.